Hi, my name is Leighton Jane. I'm Director of Development for the American Documentary and Animation Film Festival. Today we have a very special guest. It's Darius Legg. And he had this really great film called Stoker Machine. And, um, you know, I, I mean, if you're a surfer, you're going to love this this film because he really kind of gets in the culture. And I'm I'm a desert guy who, who's never really been in the ocean or surf community. But just you kind of get into it with your film and it, it's just really kind of fun. Can you talk to me about, first of all, uh, the the narrator of it, what kind of the narrator was Chad Campbell and how you came across the story? I know you touched upon it in the movie, but could you give us a quick synopsis here? Yeah, so the Stoker Machine is about this mystery surfboard that winds up on the big island of Hawaii. Um, my longtime friend, Chad Campbell, discovers the board. He recycles boards and... Normally, surfboards have dimensions and a shaper's name on them, so you're able to kind of track down where the board came from. Well, this board didn't have anything except the name Stoker Machine, an email address, and a phone number. And immediately when he told me this, I like the light bulb went off in my head that this is a story. Like, where did this board come from? <laughs> I thought of that Searching for Sugarman movie, you know, like, wow, like, right. what if this is attached to some larger than life character? which, you know, I don't want to give away the ending, but it, it is connected to a very interesting story. And um, it took three years to make. And, and it, <laughs> it, it, yeah, yeah. It came and at it, a very interesting time in my life too, because I was, I was moving away from, I was very burnt out on life and work. And so the film in a lot of ways, like reignited my personal passion and stoke for life um, mm -hmm. because I was just doing it for its own sake. I wasn't, I wasn't doing it to like win awards or even try to get into festivals like yours. It was just, <laughs> it, it was just uh, amazing. It turned out that way. So let, let's, let's explore this. You said you were burnt out, burnt yeah. out from filmmaking, surfing. I mean, you have, you have such a collect, eclectic background. Which one was mm. it that was burning you out? And, and the timetable yeah. kind of speaks with COVID. Was that a factor too? Oh, COVID was a big factor. I think COVID exasperated a decade's worth of, um, you see, like, you know, I, I've said this before um, uh, uh, in, a, in a keynote I gave at TEDx, but like, it's like, you don't know how miserable and depressed you can be till all your dreams come true. So I had the dream job. I was working at a studio. I was in charge of a creative team. I was, I was like doing everything I ever wanted. I even created um, programming for them that won Golden Telly Awards. So I was, and I was making good money. I was able to live remotely in Hawaii. I was surfing every day. And yet I was incredibly unsatisfied. Mm -hmm. And after some deep reflection, because you ask yourself, well, why? Why would that happen? Mm -hmm. um, it, it became apparent to me um, that I was seeking my personal stoke outside of myself all the time. It was like I was so goal oriented and so accomplishment oriented that it was like everything was a means to an end to get somewhere else instead of just approaching things for their own sake and enjoying um, the process. But but just be paying attention to where I was actually at and what was actually happening. And once once that realization happened in conjunction with this film coming into my life. Um, serendipitously it became apparent to me well I'll commit to this thing stoker machine and the commitment promise to myself is I'm going to do it for its own sake and um, that changed everything mm -hmm. and and it just it began that process of making the film yeah and it was uh, quite different than making commercial work <laughs> <laughs> well I, I I got a chance to see your film and you can feel the passion in your film. And I think that's what makes oh. it so special because Thanks, Layton. it's one of Thank those you. things it's hard to describe, but when you watch it, you feel it and you can't really describe it or sometimes pinpoint it. But your mm. passion for surfing is obvious in there. Your passion for people is is in there. And, uh, you know, it's funny that you talk about it. I, I covered boxing and, uh, you know, I, it, there was a, a pinnacle in my career where uh, I wanted a war I had searched out for and the subject I covered, he, he reached his pinnacle. And I don't think we were both very happy or satisfied that we reached our, our ultimate goal. And, you know, I think we were kind of like the same process you were is just, uh, 
you know, trying to learn to be more present, enjoy what you have, enjoy those moments because it's more the process than the goal. And if you yeah. enjoy and you're part of that process, you enjoy that process, that's really the win, not necessarily the goal. Because sometimes your your process and your journey takes you a lot of left turns and stuff like that. And yes. now when we're talking about left turns, let's get back to your film. And without trying to give away too much about your film, how many left turns did you face when making this film? Because obviously with a lot of filmmakers I've talked to, you know, it was going to be one thing, then become another. And there's a lot of these other turns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was it that you wanted to do with the film and then what kind of things changed during the process of making this? Oh, thank you for asking that. That's maybe one of the, the best questions anyone's ever asked about the film because it touches on something that's very personal and means a lot to me was that commitment I mentioned before of I'm going to just do this for its own sake also entailed, I don't know what this is. I don't know. Yet I will be vigilant and resilient in turning every stone to find out and allow the film to tell me what it wants to be. I sure I knew it was a film about I gotta find where it came from. I gotta know where the board came from, and there's gotta be a beginning, middle, end. And of course, there's all those those you know uh, filmmaking basics, storytelling basics. I knew all those things had to happen, but I didn't know what they were. I just knew they were signposts I had to get to along the way mm -hmm. um so some major things that happened were like for example in the first year my hard drive crashed this is a film with 2d animation cell by cell animation and and I had lost close to a thousand drawings in a heart in, in, in a crash of a computer and I had to start over uh -huh. and it was like I went to 3D. I started using Unreal Engine, which is a gaming um, engine that people use to build gaming, uh, to build games. And it's also a wonderful um, real-time rendering program that allows you to see 3D environments in real time. And so I was able to like be, start building the film like a Pixar animated film. Oh. And I did that. And I did a bunch of scene tests, um, which I can send you. And, and I put them in the film and it was so clear the film didn't want to be that. It was like, oh my God, like even those like rudimentary drawings I had in there before like were better than this because this is not the film's vibe, right? So right. I, I started to learn very clearly at, in year one, like, okay, uh, the film wants to be hand-drawn. It wants to be that. So I went back to the drawing board literally and the drawings got better because now I'm a better animator a year later. I'm still mm -hmm. showing up every day to the desk and doing the work. The backgrounds got better. I started to start to see the art direction more clearly. Um, so the film started to pivot its way towards what it ends up being with the art direction it has. And um, I don't think any of that would have been possible if I um, didn't lose all those drawings and the hard drive didn't crash. So I guess the point of making it, and then the ending also of the film was also not known. You know, it took mm -hmm. a long time and it was hard to find out where the board came from. And once I did, everything that could go wrong went wrong. Um, mm -hmm. uh, including, you know, like having to deal with like uh, a really dangerous situation, like, like borderline life-threatening situation. So um, <laughs> It was gnarly. It was so gnarly, but I stayed open to the process the whole time because I kept reminding myself, like, I'm discovering. I'm Magellan here. I'm exploring. Like, I'm I'm an explorer of this thing. I'm not going to come in and pretend I know everything. I hope that answers the question. No, that does. Um, uh, you know, it, it yeah. brings up a, another question is how scary is it to go through this kind of a process where you're mm. you're going to invest a lot of time in something you don't know what it's, it is or what it's going to be? Yeah. And uh, it's really a courageous way of doing it, mm. but it, I mean, it, it, but it, but the rewards are greater, I think, in a lot of ways. But I agree. that's a scary process, and you know, I assume beginning and middle until you have an end. Can you talk yeah. to me about just going on that whole process? Because I don't think anyone would consider doing that just because. Yeah. You know, we don't. If, you know, it's hard to go on a journey where you don't know where the destination is. <laughs> Funny you say that because I I don't think I, I'm I'm on I'm beginning my next film uh, I've already started and I don't think I'll go back to doing it any other way uh, <laughs> because 
because like you say, it is so rewarding. I've found, now look, like I've been making films for 13 years, I guess, quote unquote, professionally. And mm -hmm. I've discovered this new way of doing it. I didn't do it this way until Stoker Machine. I started Stoker Machine in 2020. Mm -hmm. And now that I know this exists, now that I know this way of making art exists, it's not just films because, you know, I illustrate and write as well. And and now that I've kind of unshackled all the, the, I, the burden of knowledge I used to carry, I say, like the, <laughs> that I had to know, I knew too much. But now that I've like, like unlearned everything and let it all go, it is terrifying. There's no doubt about that. I'm not going to sit here and say that like, that doesn't keep me up at night. Of course it does. Of course it does. Of course it does. But I've just developed a better relationship with that fear. I've developed a really good relationship with like uncertainty and um, I, I, I kind of get a high off it now. Like thinking about, I get to practice that muscle of um, being okay and calm through uncertainty. It, it's a quite an interesting skill to develop that everyone's capable of developing. I think as artists, we're really lucky. We get to do it in, um, well, through our art, you know, mm -hmm. So, you know, I was, I was a journalist. I was a writer. That's so always, cool. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that is so that. cool. Yeah. And what I've told people, it takes people, even if you write for a while, it takes you a while to find your voice. Because, you know, when you write, you start, you follow like templates, but after a while, you have to, it has to sound like you have to incorporate who you are. Even as a reporter, there, certain writers have a certain voice. Yeah. How much do you feel that this process helped you find your voice? Even though you've been in this in this career for 13 years, you know, you talking to me about this, the way you animated stuff, it felt like you, you found your voice and how you wanted to do it. It wasn't the best technology. It was the technology that worked for what this film needed. And, it, and, it, and I saw it. It really does work very, very well. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Um, so is, is the question, how did I how did the process of making this film help me find my voice? Yeah, or did you feel it did help define your oh, voice, maybe? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I'd be, I would be careful saying, I wa I'm not sure I would want to define it yet, because I'm hoping it's still going. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but, but yes, though. Yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, the film, because, you know, I shifted my insides, like the way I framed approaching the work completely shifted, which you know, um, I don't know if it's irony. Well, I guess it is that when you when you let go of grasping onto something you really want, it, it creates a vacuum and it comes to you. And so maybe in a way, what happened was I had let go of everything I knew about filmmaking and the way it's supposed to be and the way I'm supposed to do it. And I said, F all that. I'm going to do it the way I've always wanted to do it. I love surfing. I love documentaries and I love animation. What does it look like if I mash it up? and not give a hoot what anyone thinks and really make it for me. <laughs> um, what happens? It's, it's like a, a mental exercise. It's an experiment. It started that way, got through a couple years, a year, I guess, a year and a half. And, that, and then in the second round of animations, I really felt confident. I was like, okay, okay. I'm starting to see, um, I'm starting to see the line work I just started to observe my work differently. I'm like, I'm starting to see what the way it just feels like, um, um, you know, I'm like, I'm like surrounded by a bunch of trees right now and I'm looking at them thinking like, you know, they, they have their way of being as a tree that's like unique to them. Mm -hmm. And it, it, and those, those branches know exactly how they're supposed to grow. And mm -hmm. I think when you're an artist, you know, of no matter what discipline you're in or medium you're in, like, it's the same thing. Like there's a natural tendency we all have. That's our way of writing, our way of drawing, our way of putting the camera in the room to give you a perspective. Um, I think the, the real ch talent or challenge is, you know, reconnecting with your natural tendencies, you know, um, and then make, and making this film was that like, I, I was like really stoked. I, I kind of, put the blinders on to the rest of the world and just said, I want to listen to what's inside myself and then allow the, allow that to come out. Um, 
and now I recognize when I'm off course. So like if I sit down and draw or if I sit down and write, because it still happens, like I'll, I'll catch myself. I'm like, oh, I'm, 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 I'm like doing this the way I was taught or something, you know, like I was doing this. I have to, I have to find out what do I really, what was the way I would want to do it? Like, you know, mm-hmm. and there's, that's a great joy to me to do it that way. Yeah. And, and Chad, yeah. Chad really felt like a collaborator in this film. Can you talk to me about your relationship with him? Oh, absolutely. So uh, when I was 16 years old, um, I was I was uh, coming up as a pro surfer. I was sponsored by Billabong. And uh, my mentor at the time was a guy named Shane Dorian, who's a living legend today in the surf world. And um, this is in the town of Kona. And his really good friend, Ch- Shane's really good friend, was a guy named Chad Campbell. And I was introduced to him because Shane was mentoring me. And he was like, you know, it'd be really good for you to be in the surf film that my friend's making. Because he was making a documentary called The Fifth Symphony Document. Well, wow. I got to learn how a film was made by watching Chad make a film. I was in the film as a surfer, but Chad really showed me unknowingly that um, he showed me how to make a film. I saw the sausage was made. Like he showed me that I didn't need a lot of experience. I just needed courage. I didn't need fancy equipment. I just needed uh, something to record the moment with. And he also showed me that like, um, you don't even really need a lot of money at all. It's just, you need, you need like the, the desire to move forward with it. And so that was like 20 years ago. And then you fast forward to the pandemic. Now he's my neighbor by chance. He brings home this board and it just all seems so meant to be like in a full circle way. And it's funny because when I toured the film last year to a couple other film festivals that were surf based film festivals, the, mm-hmm. some of the directors of the festival or the jury members, they were like fans of Chad's movie. They knew Chad's movie and were so stoked to see Chad on camera now <laughs> in a movie like about his passion, about what he loves, you know, what makes him stoked. And so it was very, he's a huge collaborator in the film. I, I was really, my whole thing was to stay out of the way of the film and, and allow him, I, I was so, my whole intention was capture the essence of Stoke and capture my my friend I really admire as, as close to the truth as I can to the way I see him. Um, mm-hmm. And so I would, yeah, I mean, the film wouldn't be the film without Chad at all. He's the, he's, he is the film. Like he, he is Stoke, you know, like he is Stoke. So yeah, <laughs> huge collaborator. Yeah. I did get to watch the film and I gotta tell you, you know, when I first saw it, I was like, well, what is this? I'm trying to figure it out. But I was so taken by it and it really, wow. and I met you before I saw the film and I gotta tell you, I really did feel your, your vibe and your essence in this movie. It really does capture your passions wow. and stuff like that. That's such a really cool accomplishment with your film because you know sometimes you see films and you know when you're a journalist you have to be the uh uh uh, what do they call the objective spectator i I might have messed that up sure no that sounds about i mean that makes perfect sense yeah right but with you you can feel that and i think that's kind of what makes this movie so interesting that you're taking us on this journey and you're like Wow, I'm not a surfer. I don't understand this, but I'm really intrigued by this. I thought you did a great job, and and it's Thank funny you. you were mentioning uh, what was that movie that you mentioned that you 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 structured it along finding um oh uh, searching for Sugarman searching for Sugarman. I actually caught him at Coachella several years ago. Wow, Sugarman. I watched him perform. It was really cool. Not, yeah, I didn't Rodriguez, get a chance to watch right? the documentary. I have to go watch that now. Oh my gosh, you're going to, um, um, we have to, when we get together, we have to talk about your experience. I want to hear about your experience watching that movie. Uh, I'm so curious what you think of it. Uh, uh, you know, uh, radically different than Stoker Machine, but, mm-hmm. but I think now that I've said that, you're going to, like, there's a, there's a, um, let's just say like a Bigfoot sighting, quote unquote, like type of vibe that, that they have in their movie, Searching for Sugarman, that I was trying to get with whoever we find out this board came from and and i was trying to kind of do that vibe you know because a lot of it is in my opinion filmmaking the way i approach it is like i try to back engineer the feeling a movie gave me 
So mm. I'm 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 not so much trying to back engineer the technical side of it as the feelings. Like how do I elicit and conduct like a conductor, it, you know, um I feel, you know, like we're conducting the audience's emotions as directors and filmmakers. And so if I see a film I really like, it's through feelings that I really like or that elicited out of me. Sometimes they're scary and they're not the most enjoyable feelings, but I, I enjoyed the thrill. And then, and then when it's time to make one, it's like, um, okay, I'm I'm going for a, a a vibe, and how do I get to the vibe? Right. Uh, that's the that's I think the most fun, um, because it's like we're really talking about smoke here. You know, this is all smoke and mirrors, but that's the stuff I love. You know, I like magic and I like magic tricks, and so I'm I'm like. I'm always looking at the hand. I'm looking at the hand uh, that you're you're not supposed to be looking at. You know, like I'm trying to figure out how did they do it? How did they do? How did they do it? <laughs> you know. Yeah. So um, this part is, you know, we we got through our 13th festival, and you were one of the great people that was involved in our festival. Can you talk to me about your uh, experience at Amdocs and what were some of your your memorable mm -hmm. moments and also memorable films that you saw? Yeah. Well, that was one of the most memorable is a great word because I don't think I'll ever forget that experience. I met so many peers and colleagues and, and now friends that, you know, I think animators and documentarians are a real special bunch because you got to be crazy to make a documentary and you got to be crazy to make an animated picture. And when you combine them, like yeah it's a really special group of people and i mean that in the best way like they're so brave and the vibe of the festival that i really liked was it's it's like you could tell well it's weird saying this in front of you because like you're one of the people who made it who put it on but you can tell like you guys actually want us to to meet each other and the way it's structured with the dinners at night and the way it's structured, like, um, with the events that go on, like yoga and meditation and stuff like mornings, it's like you create these environments and then I guess we as like seedlings get the sprout, you know? And that's what's so special is like you guys created a really good environment and and very hands off, you know, like, which is, which is so cool. It's a great way to lead. It's a great way to put groups together, I think. Um, so Amdocs. I don't know. It's I'll never forget it. And in fact, like it like motivates me to want to like make my next film in time for next year. You know, like because I I'm like I don't want I don't want to miss out. <laughs> like um, I want to be a part of it. Uh, people that really stood out to me um, that I met. Uh, I really loved the couple that that made Fortune Cookie, um, yeah. with stop animation, and um, I really appreciated. Chris is uh, the cinematographer. Um, um, Blavelt. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. How do you say his last name? I think it's Blavelt. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Chris. Chris is epic. His story is epic, and to hear it in person was awesome. He's worked on some of my favorite movies. So is Tim Allen, um, the animator. Mm -hmm. He worked on um, Isle of Dog and uh, uh, Corpse's Bride. And the other Wes Anderson movie, um, Fantastic Mr. Fox. So, again, like meeting these people in lot in real life at the after party, at the dinner, and they're just regular folk like us, just talking story, getting to know each other. I mean, Chris and I like walked away from a conversation. And they're like, I think we solved all the world's problems. <laughs> you know, it was like it was just such a deep, con it was like a, such a quick in the deep end convo, which is a testament to his open heartedness and and amazingness. Uh, those are even, I don't even know if those are words, but yeah. So the the vibe in the group, and those are those were the people that I really um, appreciated um, to get to meet, and you know, and then oh Azad, and I, I gotta mention his this guy, this wonderful guy named Azad. He made a film um, called some uh, something the something the blacksmith. Um, anyway, we went to lunch. Mm -hmm. And I love, I love people. I love listening to their stories. So I'm always inquisitive, like, and I want to hear it. Cause I, I see people's story playing in my head, like a movie when they're telling it to me. And we had lunch and he told me a story. He's from, he's, he's Kurdish. 
Mm. And for people who don't know, Kurdish people don't really have a country. They're, they're kind of on the border of Iran and Iraq and Turkey. And they're, they're tribal people. And he told me his story, which I'm not going to tell it because it's his to tell. But mm-hmm. it just was, I mean, it was humbling. It was incredibly adventurous. And it only happened. He only it only happened less than a decade ago. I mean, coming to America, and like, and this guy is so talented as a filmmaker. And um, I don't know. I I just was so moved by that 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 I got to have that experience just by going to the festival. You know what I'm saying? Like it's like, mm-hmm. yeah, that yeah, that was special. But shout out Azad. <laughs> Thank you for sharing <laughs> your story. <laughs> well, shout yeah. out. I mean. It's the great part about this is everyone has different uh, experiences. I didn't meet everyone, but you know, you're telling me about people I didn't get a chance to meet, so I'm gonna go have to look up uh, as yeah. well. There's so many films and everything like that. Well, we're running out of time. I'm sorry. Okay. I wish we had more oh. time to talk, but we'll catch up right. since you're in the you're in the area. Absolutely, let's do it, my brother. I'm so stoked. Thank you for this opportunity to talk with you, and um, yeah, thank you for for. Um, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for for like putting the time and energy that you and Teddy do and, and the staff. It really, dude, it goes such a long way in, in helping us independent artists and filmmakers like keep going. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it means everything. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you for thank giving you. us a platform. Yeah. Thank you so much. We, we appreciate it. We appreciate you. Thank you for sharing your film with us. And I guess we should say that your film, if you haven't seen it, you can find it on YouTube. That's right. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Stoker and that's Machine how I and DariusLeg.com. Yeah. Also there. Yeah. I have a newsletter, by the way, the Stoker Machine newsletter. So if anyone wants to join it, it goes out once a month to DariusLeg.com. And um, it touches on a lot of the ideas that we've talked about here together. So if that mm-hmm. sounds interesting, you know, it helps keep the lights on at Stoker Machine. <laughs> well, you're also the, the king thing. of all media. You also have a TED Talk that's in there. You have the film yeah. you have your newsletter you're a one-man yeah. industry <laughs> well hopefully a group soon um, so anyone yeah. who wants to come help spread yeah well by. maybe you know some of these surfboard Reach companies out. should be investing in you or something like that maybe <laughs> That'd unless be you well actually maybe that's too commercial but who knows yeah. <laughs> you know as long as they're spreading stoke in the world and and um the materials are ethically sourced i'm all about it so <laughs> let's go <laughs> yeah well Thanks again. I'm just going to remind everyone, uh, we completed our 13th year. That We already have dates for the 14th annual American Documentary and Animation Film Festival. It's going to be March 27th through 31st, 2025. We hope to see you there, including you, Darius. Uh, we have a lot of terrific films. We have a lot of terrific filmmakers. So uh, start start marking those dates. And if you're a filmmaker, we're already taking submissions. So uh, oh, wow. look us up on the website. And- uh, if you have a film that's ready, send it over, and, and Teddy will start uh, evaluating them. He goes through two thousand films every year, so we're trying. We think he has wow. too much free time, so we want to try to get that up to three thousand. Okay, so, <laughs> <laughs> so folks, Darius, that thank is, you again. Yeah. And then, uh, and then Teddy, hopefully, we're gonna get you more work. <laughs> okay, love you long time, my brother. I'll see you soon. All right, love you, my brother. Take care. Right, we'll bye. see you. Thank bye. you very much. Thank you. Bye.